Here we are in Kusinara, where the Buddha's body was cremated. So I thought I would take the opportunity to read from the life story of the Buddha a little bit leading up to that occasion. So Venerable Ananda asks, how should we treat the perfect one's remains? So this is just to give you an idea to the, to the lead up to the cremation. So today we were at the very site where Lord Buddha attained Mahaparinibbana and then we also went in the afternoon to the cremation pyre, the place where the body was cremated. Lord Buddha, how shall we treat the perfect one's remains? Ananda, do not preoccupy yourself about venerating the perfect one's remains. Please strive for your own goal. Devote yourselves to your own goal. Dwell diligent, ardent and self-controlled for your own good. There are wise warriors and brahmins and householders who believe in the perfect one. They will see to venerating the perfect one's remains. So the Buddha does his duty, telling his disciples to practice. Ananda does his duty as the attendant. But Lord, how should one treat the perfect one's remains? Treat the perfect one's remains in the same way that remains of a universal monarch who turns the wheel of righteousness are treated. But Lord, how should one treat the remains of a universal monarch who turns the wheel of righteousness? They wrap his remains in new cloth, then they wrap them in well-beaten cloth, then they wrap them in new cloth, and proceeding in that way they wrap them in five hundred twin layers. Then they place them in an iron oil vessel, which they close with another vessel. Then they make a pyre with all kinds of scents and burn the remains. Then they build a monument to him at the four crossroads. That is how they treat the remains of a universal monarch who turns the wheel of righteousness. And the perfect one's remains should be treated in the same way. So a universal monarch is a, a king who had the... the Barami basically to rule the whole world and who ruled justly. So it's appropriate to burn the Buddha as a leader of the highest caliber. The perfect one's monument should be built at the four crossroads and whoever shall put flowers or scents on it or whitewash it or worship it or feel confidence in his heart there, that will be long for his welfare and happiness. So this is interesting and relevant to us on pilgrimage because we're offering flowers, fragrances, chanting, bowing, meditating. So this is the words of Lord Buddha, that those who put flowers or scents or whitewash or worship or feel confidence in their heart there, so that word confidence is probably faith, satha in Pali, so that will be for his welfare and happiness for a long time. There are these four who are worthy of a monument. What four? A perfect one, accomplished and fully enlightened, a Pacheka Buddha, a perfect one's disciple who is an arahant and a universal monarch who turns the wheel of righteousness. And what is the aim in view of which any one of these four is worthy of a monument? There are many who feel confidence in their hearts, thinking, this is the monument of the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened, or this is the monument of the Blessed One, a Pacheka Buddha, or this is the monument of a disciple of the Blessed One, or this is the monument of that righteous and lawful king. When they feel confidence in their hearts there, then on the dissolution of the body after death, they reappear in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. So Lord Buddha is talking here about recollecting worthy objects of recollection and giving rise to that feeling of faith and confidence. So that's a very bright mind state, isn't it? So we've all been practicing with that, practicing recollecting Lord Buddha, practicing recollecting the teachings. <coughs> practicing recollecting the Sangha and then the mind becomes bright and happy. So this is a meditation discipline and we can see, that, so Lord Buddha is explaining that this is, what, this is the value of building such monuments because it helps, it's like a tool, it helps people to brighten their minds in that way by recollecting that which inspires confidence. Then the Venerable Ananda went inside a dwelling and he stood leaning against the door bar and wept. I am still only a learner whose task has not yet been completed. My teacher is about to attain final Nibbana, my teacher who has compassion on me. And then the Blessed One asked the bhikkhus, bhikkhus, where is Ananda? Lord, he has just gone inside a dwelling and he is standing leaning against the door bar, weeping. I am still only a learner whose task has not yet been completed. 
My teacher is about to attain final nibbana. My teacher who has compassion on me. The Blessed One told the bhikkhu, Come, bhikkhu, go to Ananda and say to him in my name, The teacher calls you friend, Ananda. Even so, Lord, the bhikkhu replied, and he went to the Venerable Ananda and told him, The teacher calls you friend, Ananda. Even so, friend, the Venerable Ananda replied, and he went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he stood at one side. The Blessed One said to him, Enough, Ananda, do not sorrow, do not lament. Have I not already repeatedly told you that there is a separation and parting and division from all that is dear and beloved? How could it be that what is born, come to being, formed and bound to fall should not fall? That is not possible. Ananda, you have long and constantly attended on the perfect one with bodily acts of loving kindness, helpfully, gladly, sincerely and without reserve. And so too with verbal acts and mental acts. You have made merit. Ananda, keep on endeavouring and you will soon be free from taints. Again we come back to this fact that merit supports insight. So Buddha's words once again, you have made merit, Ananda. Keep on endeavouring and you will soon be free from taints. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, the accomplished, fully enlightened ones in the past, also had attendants who were to them what Ananda is to me. And the accomplished, fully enlightened ones in the future will also have attendants who will be to them what Ananda is to me. Ananda is wise. He knows this is the time for bhikkhus to come and see the perfect one. This is the time for bhikkhunis to come and see the perfect one. This is the time for laymen, lay followers. This is the time for women, lay followers to come and see the perfect one. This is the time for kings, kings' ministers, sectarians and sectarians' disciples to come and see the perfect one. There are four wonderful and marvelous things in a universal monarch who turns the wheel of righteousness. What for? If an assembly of warrior nobles or brahmins or householders or monks should come to see him, the assembly is glad to see him. If he speaks there, the assembly is glad at his speech. But when he is silent again, the assembly is still unsated. So too, there are four wonderful and marvelous things in Ananda. What for? If an assembly of bhikkhus or bhikkhunis, or men lay followers, or women lay followers, should come to see Ananda, the assembly is glad to see him. If he speaks there, the assembly is glad at his speech. But when he is silent again, the assembly is still unsated. When he had spoken thus, the Venerable Ananda said, Lord, let the Blessed One not attain final Nibbana in this little mud-walled town, this backwoods town, this brand township. There are other great cities like Champa, Rajagaha, Savati, Saketa, Kosambi and Banaras. Let the Blessed One attain final Nibbana there. There are many prominent warrior nobles and Brahmins and householders who believe in the Perfect One. They will venerate the Perfect One's remains. Do not say so, Ananda, do not say a little mud-walled town, a backwards town, a branch township. There was once a king called Sudasana the Great. He was a righteous, lawful, universal monarch who turned the wheel of righteousness, a conqueror of the four quarters who had stabilized his country and who possessed the seven treasures. His capital city was Kusinara, then called Kusawati. It was twelve leagues wide from east to west and seven leagues broad from north to south. The royal capital, Kusawati, was as mighty and prosperous with as many inhabitants and as crowded with people and full of plenty as the royal capital city of the gods called Alakamanda. The royal city of Kusawati never lacked the ten kinds of sounds, that is to say, the sounds of elephants, horses, chariots, drums, tabors, lutes, songs, cymbals, gongs, and the cries of eat, drink, taste, as the tenth sound. We were talking earlier today about the possibility that Lord Buddha knew that there would be, and I'm, I will read that a little later, a lot of uh, desire for his relics from the leaders of the kingdoms who by now had great faith in him. So it's possible that by choosing this little backwater town at that time, Lord Buddha was, uh, was ensuring that, as later happened, each of the kingdoms was given a portion of the relics. Now Ananda go into Kusanara and announce to the Malians of Kusanara, tonight Vasetas, in the last watch, the perfect one's attainment of final Nibbana will take place. 
Come forth, Vasetas, come forth, lest you regret it later and think. The perfect one's attainment of final Nibbana took place in our own town precincts and we did not get to see the perfect one in the last hour. Even so, Lord, the Venerable Ananda replied, and he dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went into Kusanara with another bhikkhu. Now at that time the Malians of Kusanara had met together in their assembly hall for some business or other. The Venerable Ananda went to the assembly hall and announced to them, Tonight, Vasetas, in the last watch, the perfect one's attainment of final Nibbana will take place. Come forth, Vasetas, lest you regret it later and think. The perfect one's attainment of final Nibbana took place in our town precincts and we did not go to see the perfect one in the last hour. When they heard this from the Venerable Ananda, the Malians with their young men and maidens and matrons were dismayed and aghast. Overcome by grief, some tore their hair and wept. Some stretched out their arms and wept. Some fell down and rolled back and forth, crying out, So soon the Blessed One will attain final Nibbana. So soon the Sublime One will attain final Nibbana. So soon the eye will vanish from the world. Dismayed and aghast, overcome by grief as they were, the Malians with their young men and maidens and matrons went to the Venerable Ananda in the Malian Sala tree grove at the turn into Kusanara. Then he thought, If I let the Malians of Kusanara salute the Blessed One singly, the night will be over before they can finish. Suppose I get them to salute the Blessed One with a single representative for each clan thus, Lord, the Malians named so-and-so, with his children, his wife and his retinue and friends, salute the Blessed One with his head at the Blessed One's feet. And he did so. And in that way he got them to salute the Blessed One within the first watch. However, a wanderer called Subhada was staying in Kusanara at that time. He heard, Tonight in the last watch the monk Gotama's attainment of final Nibbana will take place. And then he thought, I have heard from senior elders, teachers among the wanderers, that perfect ones appear in the world from time to time, accomplished and fully enlightened. And tonight, in the last watch, the monk Gotama's attainment of final Nibbana will take place. While there is this doubt in me yet, I have confidence in the monk Gotama that he can teach me the Dhamma in such a way that I can rid myself of this doubt. He went to the Malian Sala tree grove at the turn into Kusanara, and he approached the Venerable Ananda and told him all that had occurred to him, adding, If only I might see the monk Gotama, Master Ananda. The Venerable Ananda said, Enough, friend Subhada, do not trouble the perfect one, the blessed one is tired. The wanderer Subhada made the same request a second and a third time and received the same reply. The blessed one heard their conversation, then he told the Venerable Ananda, Enough, Ananda, do not keep Subhada out, let him see the perfect one. Whatever he may ask of me, he will ask it only for the sake of knowledge, not to cause trouble, and what I can tell him he will quickly understand. Then a venerable Ananda told the wanderer Subhata, Go, friend Subhata, the Blessed One gives you permission. He went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him, and when his courteous formal talk was finished, he sat down at one side. Then he said to the Blessed One, Master Gotama, there are these monks and Brahmins, each with his community, with his group, leading a group, each a renowned and famous philosopher, reckoned by many as a saint. I mean Purana Kasapa. Makali Gosala, Ajita Kesakambalin, Pakuda Kachayana, Sanjaya Belatiputta, and the Niganta Nataputta. Have they all had direct knowledge as they claim, or have none of them had direct knowledge, or have some of them had direct knowledge and some not? Enough, Subhata. Whether they have all had direct knowledge as they claim, or none of them have had direct knowledge, or some of them have had direct knowledge and some not, let that be. I shall teach you the Dhamma, Subhata. Listen and attend carefully to what I shall say. Even so, Lord, he replied. Subhata, in whatever Dhamma and discipline the noble eightfold path is not found, there the first monk is not found, the second monk is not found, the third monk is not found, and the fourth monk is not found. In whatever Dhamma and discipline the noble eightfold path is found, there the first monk is found, the second monk is found, the third monk is found, and the fourth monk is found. The Noble Eightfold Path is found in the Dhamma and Discipline Subhada, and it is only here that the first, the second, the third and the fourth monk is found. Others' doctrines are devoid of monks. If these bhikkhus live rightly, the world will not be devoid of arahants, of accomplished ones. Age 29 Subhada, I went forth, seeking after what is wholesome. 
and more than fifty years have now gone by. Since then, Subhadra, the time when I went forth, outside this dispensation never a monk is there who treads the way of Dhamma even in part. Nor is there the second, third or fourth monk. Others' doctrines are devoid of monks, but if these bhikkhus live rightly, the world will not be devoid of arahants. Then the wanderer Subhadra said, Magnificent Lord, Magnificent Lord, the Dhamma has been made clear in many ways by the Blessed One as though he were a writing the overthrown, revealing the hidden, showing the way to one who is lost, holding up a lamp in the darkness for those with eyes to see visible forms. I go to the Blessed One for refuge and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. I should like to receive the going forth and the admission from the Blessed One. One who has already been a sectarian Subhadra and who wants the going forth and admission into this Dhamma and discipline is usually put on probation for four months. At the end of the four months, if the bhikkhus are satisfied, they give him the going forth and admit him to the state of a bhikkhu. But I know that there are personal exceptions here. Lord, if that is so, then let me be put on probation for four years. And at the end of the four years, if the bhikkhus are satisfied, they will give me the going forth and admit me to the state of a bhikkhu. But the Blessed One told the Venerable Ananda, Now Ananda give Subhadra the going forth. Even so, Lord, the Venerable Ananda replied. Then the wanderer Subhadra said to the Venerable Ananda, It is a gain for you, friend Ananda, it is a great gain that you have been anointed here in the Master's presence with the pupil's anointing. And the wanderer Subhadra received the going forth under the Blessed One and he received the admission. Then not long after his admission, dwelling alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent and self-controlled, the Venerable Subhadra, by realization himself with direct knowledge, here and now, entered upon and dwelt in that supreme goal of the holy life for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the house life into homelessness. He knew directly, birth is exhausted, the holy life has been lived out, what was to be done is done, there is no more of this to come. And the Venerable Subhadra became one of the Arahants. He was the last of the Blessed One's disciples to testify. Then the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, you may think the word of the teacher is a thing of the past. Now we have no more teacher. But you should not regard it so. The Dhamma and discipline taught by me and laid down for you are your teacher after I am gone. Up till now bhikkhus have addressed each other with the word friend, but it should not be done after I am gone. A senior bhikkhu should, be addressed, should address a junior bhikkhu by his name or his family name or as friend. A junior bhikkhu should address a senior bhikkhu as a venerable one. The Sangha can, if it wishes, abolish the lesser and minor rules when I am gone. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, it may be that some bhikkhu has a doubt or a problem concerning the Buddha or the Dhamma or the Sangha or the path or the way of progress. Ask bhikkhus so that you may not regret it afterwards. Thinking thus, the teacher was face to face with us and we could not bring ourselves to ask in the Blessed One's presence. When this was said, the bhikkhus were silent. A second and a third time the Blessed One spoke the same words, and each time they were silent. Then he addressed them thus, Because perhaps you do not ask because you are in awe of the teacher. Let a friend tell it to a friend. When this was said, they were silent. Then a venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, It is wonderful, Lord, it is marvelous. I have such confidence in the Sangha of Bhikkhus that I believe there is not one Bhikkhu with a doubt or a problem concerning the Buddha or the Dharma or the Sangha or the path or the way of progress. You, Ananda, speak out of confidence. But the Perfect One has knowledge that here in this Sangha of Bhikkhus there is not one Bhikkhu who has any doubt concerning the Buddha or the Dhamma or the Sangha or the path or the way of progress. The most backward of these 500 Bhikkhus is a stream enterer, no more subject to perdition, certain of rightness and destined to enlightenment. Then the Blessed One addressed the Bhikkhus thus, Indeed, Bhikkhus, I declare this to you. It is in the nature of all formations to dissolve, attain perfection through diligence. This was the Perfect One's last utterance. The next we're going to read the process of the Buddha's actual Parinibbana, which is really amazing. But first of all, isn't it, it's just beautiful to acknowledge the Buddha's compassion. There he is, moments away from... Uh, entering Nibbana and he makes the time to teach one final disciple and he makes the time to ask his following are there any doubts and he asks them to regard him as a friend and speak to him as a friend 
So here we see the Buddha's compassion and beautiful father-like uh, kindness towards his following, seeing that there were no doubts, and basically he had done his job very well. He's going to enter Nibbana now, the final Nibbana. Then the Blessed One entered upon the first meditation. Emerging from that, he entered upon the second meditation, that's the jhana. Emerging from that, he entered upon the third jhana. Emerging from that, he entered upon the fourth jhana. Emerging from that, he entered upon the base consisting of infinity of space, the fifth jhana. Emerging from that, he entered upon the base consisting of the infinity of consciousness, the sixth jhana. Emerging from that, he entered upon the base consisting of nothingness, the seventh jhana. Emerging from that, he entered upon the base consisting of neither perception nor non-perception, eighth jhana. Emerging from that, he entered upon the cessation of perception and feeling. Then the Venerable Ananda said to the Venerable Anuruddha, Lord, the Blessed One has attained final Nibbana. No, friend. Venerable Anuruddha was foremost in divine eye, equal to the Buddha in his divine eye, so that capacity to read minds, and he could see, he could see any being in any state, in any universe, if he wanted to, just like the Buddha could. So Venerable Anuruddha had the most profound divine eye. So the Venerable Aruda could see exactly what was happening with the Buddha's mind as he was going through these very profound concentrations. And he says, No, friend, the Blessed One has not attained final nibbana. He has attained the cessation of perception and feeling. Then the Blessed One, emerging from the cessation of perception and feeling, once again entered the eighth jhana, and then the seventh, and then the sixth, and the fifth, down to the first jhana. And then he entered the first, the second, third and fourth jhanas and emerging from the fourth meditation the Blessed One attained final Nibbana. With the Blessed One's attainment of final Nibbana there was a great earthquake, fearful and hair-raising and the drums of heaven resounded. With the Blessed One's attainment of final Nibbana Brahma Sahampati uttered this stanza, No being in the world but shall lay down the temporary compound of its person and even such a teacher without peer in all the worlds perfected with the powers enlightened, has attained complete extinction. With the Blessed One's attainment of Nibbana, Saka, ruler of gods, uttered this stanza, Formations are impermanent, their very nature is to rise and fall, and there is none arises but must cease, true bliss lies in their stilling. So this utterance by Indra, or Saka, is uh, very beautiful and points to something which I think is important. As many of you had personal experience today when you went to meditate in the place where the Buddha attained final nirvana, many people felt sad involuntarily. So last night when I said before we actually talk about what occurred, before I give any teachings, before I give any readings, I just wanted people to feel and experience meditating there. So many people felt some sadness and some, uh, which is fair enough, because the passing of a Buddha is, in terms of sad things, it's sad. But then when I encourage people in the afternoon, in the second meditation, to, to contemplate the... Remember when the Bodhisattva was going forth, he was going forth because he believed that there was a deathless, a sorrowless, an unconditioned, and he was determined to realize it, and he did realize it. So that when the conditioned part of what was the phenomena we call the Buddha ceased, as conditions must, is it possible that the unconditioned cease? The nature of conditions is to arise and cease, and if there is an unconditioned, that which is unconditioned doesn't cease. And if the Buddha discovered a deathless, and if his mind was residing in the deathless, then what died? The body died. Greed, hatred and ignorance died at the time of the Enlightenment and the body died at the time of the Mahaparinibbana. But the deathless and the unconditioned and the mind experiencing it, that part of the mind which can experience it, you can't use the word exist because it's so subtle, I think it's beyond what we would normally call existence. But anyway, something remains which is undefinable but powerful. And so when we go and we meditate in the Mahaparinibbana's stupa, how many people felt deeply peaceful? 
in that place, most people. So you can feel something still, there's something special happened there. On one level it's sad, on a deeper level it's profound. And this statement by Saka or Indra, formations are impermanent, their very nature is to rise and fall, and there is none arises but must cease. Then this last statement, true bliss lies in their stilling. Te sang upasamo sukho. So the Buddha was already experiencing true bliss from the time he had realized Nibbana, he was already experiencing that bliss. But having a body, which is, the condi which is a result of past karmas, it still has a certain amount of dukkha associated with it. Lord Buddha did have backaches. When uh, Devadatta pushed the rock to try to kill him, there was a shard of rock which, which caused bloodshed. When he had his final meal, he had cramps and he had diarrhea. So the body comes with dukkha. It's part of its nature. The body is a, an unsatisfactory condition. But when the body ceased, that, that's what they call it, the maha parinibbana. Nibbana is cessation of, of suffering. So the body still has dukkha in it, basically, but the enlightened mind doesn't suffer. But at maha parinibbana, you get to put down the body as well, which is true bliss. So actually, we can be happy for Lord Buddha that he did his duty and he established uh, millions of beings in the goal and he said himself the Dhamma and the discipline is the teacher because he did lay down 84,000 verses of Dhamma in his 45 years of teaching and he did have his great disciples Mahamogalana and Sariputta and, and all of the others Anuruddha, Mahakasapa who trained their disciples who to this day have trained their disciples so that we can still hear the teachings of enlightened beings to this day so Lord Buddha did his, did his duty to the best of his ability, which is profound and amazing and perfect, and we have all benefited from it. But it's just beautiful, isn't it, to see his kindness as he's, as he's on his deathbed, to teach one more disciple, to see if anyone has any more doubts, is anything not clear, and then uh, to enter into Nibbana and put down the last of the burden, having given what he gave to the, to the world and the beings in the world. And with the Blessed One's attainment of final Nibbāna, some bhikkhus who were not without lust stretched out their arms and wept, and they fell down and rolled back and forth. So soon the Blessed One has attained final Nibbāna, so soon the Sublime One has attained final Nibbāna. So soon the eye has vanished from the world. But those who were free from lust, mindful and fully aware, said, Formations are impermanent. How could it be that what is born, come to being, formed and bound to fall, should not fall? That is not possible. Then the Venerable Anuruddha addressed the bhikkhus, Enough friends, do not sorrow, do not lament. Has it not already been declared by the Blessed One that there is separation and parting and division from all that is dear and beloved? How could it be that that which is born, come to being, formed and bound to fall, should not fall? That is not possible. And deities are protesting friends. Remembering Venerable Anuruddha has the perfected divine eye, which is vast. He can see the whole picture in terms of beings who come to witness the Buddha's Mahaparinibbana. And it was said in a previous verse, one monk was standing in front of the Buddha fanning him. And because he has a coarse form body, all of the devas couldn't see the, the Buddha. So they asked, the Buddha had to ask his attendant to step aside. And he said, there are so many devas, deities here, there's not one, there's not a pin prick of space in any direction, which is not full of devas who've come to witness the Buddha's passing. So Anuruddha could see that, he could see, and uh, just like the monks. Friends, there are deities, percipient of earth in space, they are tearing their hair and weeping, stretching out their arms and weeping, failing down and rolling back and forth, crying out, so soon the Blessed One has attained final Nibbana, so soon the eye has vanished from the world. And there are deities, percipient of earth in earth, who are doing likewise. But deities who are free from lust, mindful and fully aware, say, formations are impermanent. How could it be that that which is born, come to being, formed, and bound to fall, should not fall? That is not possible. So you have the enlightened devas, perfectly mindful, and you have the not quite enlightened devas crying. Venerable Anuruddha said to the Venerable Ananda, and, the, and they spent the rest of the night in talk on Dhamma. Then the Venerable Anuruddha said to the Venerable Ananda, Go, friend, into Kusanara and announce to the Malians, 
The satyrs, the Blessed One has attained final Nibbāna, now it is time for you to do as you think is fit. Even so, Venerable Ananda replied, and it being morning, he dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went to Kusanara with another bhikkhu. Now at that time the Malians of Kusanara had met together in their assembly hall for some business. The Venerable Ananda went to the assembly hall and announced to them, the satyrs, the Blessed One has attained final Nibbāna. When they heard this from the Venerable Ananda, the Malians of Kusanara with their young men and maidens and matrons were dismayed and aghast. Overcome by grief, some tore out their hair and wept, some stretched out their arms and wept, etc., etc. Then the Malians of Kusanara gave men orders, collect scents and flowers and all the instruments of music in Kusanara. And they took scents and flowers and musical instruments and also 500 lengths of cloth to where the Blessed One's body lay in the Malian sala tree grove at the turn into Kusanara. So that's where we were today. We were at the Malian Sala tree grove and one of the big trees in front of the temple is a Sala tree. And so that's uh, nice to know. We'll be going back there again tomorrow. They spent their day in paying honor, respect, reverence and veneration to the Blessed One's body with dances, songs, music, garlands and scents and in making cloth canopies and pavilions. And they thought, it's too late to burn the Blessed One's body today, we shall do it tomorrow. And so they passed the second day and the third and fourth and fifth and sixth days. On the seventh day they thought, let us bear the Blessed One's body southwards outside the town to a place south of the town, paying honor, respect, reverence and veneration to the Blessed One's body with dance, songs, music, garlands, scents. And there to the south of the town let us burn the Blessed One's body. Then eight leading Malians bathed their heads and put on new garments, thinking to lift up the Blessed One's body. They could not do so. They asked the Venerable Anuruddha the reason why. You, Vasetas, have one intention, while the deities have another. Then, Lord, what is the deity's intention? Your intention, Vasetas, is this. Let us bear the Blessed One's body southwards, outside the town, to a place south of the town, paying honor, respect, reverence, and veneration to the Blessed One's body with dances, songs, music, garlands, and scents, etc. The deity's attention is this, let us bear the Blessed One's body northwards to the north of the town, paying honor, respect, reverence, and veneration <coughs> to the Blessed One's body with dances, songs, music, garlands, and scents, and then entering by the north gate, let us bear it through the middle of the town, after which let us go out by the east gate, and there, where the Malians have a shrine called the Makuta Bandana, to the east of the town, there let us have the Blessed One's body burnt. Lord, let it be as the deities intend. And you may recall Ajahn Or was saying that that place where they burnt the body used to be the place where they coronated the kings. So it was a, a special place of, of high status. And for people who know a little bit about Feng Shui, the north and the eastern directions are auspicious. The southern direction is generally considered inauspicious. So the humans were thinking, let's do it that way, but the devas were, no, 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 there is a better way. Now, at that time, Kusanara was strewn knee-deep with mandarava flowers. Who knows what a mandarava flower is? Where is the mandarava tree? The mandarava tree is in Dawatinsa heaven, and it only sheds its flowers on the world when a Buddha is passing. So the whole of the town of Kusanara was knee-deep with mandarava flowers, even to the rubbish heaps. So the whole town has been bathed with flowers from heaven. They're very big too, mandarava flowers, according to the suttas. So paying honor, respect, reverence and veneration to the Blessed One's body with both divine and human dances, songs, music, garlands and scents, the deities with the Malians of Kusanara bore the Blessed One's body northwards to the north of the town, and entering by the north gate, they bore it through the middle of the middle of the town, and going out by the east gate to where the Malians have a shrine called the Mukata Bandana to the east of the town. There they set it down. Then the Malians of Kusanara said to the Venerable Ananda, Lord Ananda, how are we to treat the Perfect One's remains? Treat the Perfect One's remains, Vasetas, as the remains of a universal monarch who turns a will of righteousness are treated. But Lord Ananda, how is that done? And now we see the importance of Ananda's question. As the Buddha said that the Brahmins will know, but they didn't know, because it's probably been a long time since there was a wheel-turning universal monarch. And so Ananda was able to explain, as the Buddha explained, how to burn the body. Mahakasapa, who knows who Mahakasapa was? Who was Mahakasapa? 
foremost in the ascetic practices. So he was not able to make it to the funeral and he's wandering in this direction at the seven day point. And so they're trying to light the fire and an interesting thing happens. Now at that time the Venerable Mahakasapa was traveling on the high road from Pavo to Kusanara with a large number of bhikkhus, with 500 bhikkhus. Then he left the road and sat down at the root of a tree. Meanwhile, a mendicant ascetic who had picked up a mandarava flower in Kusanara was traveling by that road. The Venerable Mahakasapa saw him coming and he asked him, Do you know our teacher friend? Yes, friend, I know him. The monk Gautama attained final nibbana seven days ago. That is how I got this mandarava flower. Some of the bhikkhus who were not free from lust stretched out their arms and wept. They fell down, rolled back and forth. So soon the Blessed One has attained final nibbana. So soon the Sublime One has attained final nibbana, etc. Mahakasapa said, of course, formations are impermanent. How could it be that what is born, come to being, formed and bound to fall should not fall? That is not possible. But there was one sitting in the assembly called Subhada who had gone forth in old age. He said to those bhikkhus, Enough, friends, do not sorrow, do not lament. We are well rid of that great monk. We have been frustrated by him saying, This is allowed to you and this is not allowed to you. But now we shall do as we like and we shall not do as we do not like. So that's a very naughty monk. <laughs> and he said, it, he said it to the wrong. And he also said it to the wrong note, because the Venerable Mahakasapa is the strictest. <laughs> and so this was instrumental because Lord Buddha later says, you can do away with the to Ananda, minor and lesser rules. And I think it's Mahakasapa who says, no we won't. After the Lord Buddha passed away, the Theravadins, within a hundred years after the Buddha passed away, I think Buddhism had split into 18 schools. And one of those schools is what we inherited, the Theravanans who wanted to keep all the rules by spirit and letter. That's the lineage of Lumpur Man and Lumpur Cha coming from Mahakasapa. And uh, other lineages decided to allow salt, holding of storing of salt and touching of money, allowing money. And they use this statement of the Buddha as, a, as the justification. Salt was a, it's another subject, yes. Whether or not you can store salt was a big, was a big discussion about that at the first council. So, <laughs> anyway, we don't store salt, do we? <laughs> anyway, that's a different Dhamma talk. And okay, so... The leading Malians who had bathed their heads and put on new garments thought, let us light the Blessed One's pyre but they were unable to do so. Then they asked the Venerable Anuruddha for the reason. The deities have a different intention. But Lord, what is the deity's intention? The deity's intention is this, Vasetas. There is the Venerable Mahakasapa traveling on the high road from Pawa to Kusanara with a large community of bhikkhus, with 500 bhikkhus. The Blessed One's pyre shall not be lit until the Venerable Mahakasapa has saluted the Blessed One with his head. Then, Lord, let it be as the deities intend. Then. The Venerable Mahakasapa came to the Blessed One's pyre at the Malian's Makuta Bandana shrine at Kusanara. When he had done so, he arranged his robe on one shoulder and raising his hands, palms together, he circumambulated the pyre three times to the right. Then the Blessed One's feet were revealed and he saluted the Blessed One's feet with his head. And the 500 bhikkhus arranged their robes on one shoulder and they did as the Venerable Mahakasapa had done. And as soon as they had finished, the pyre caught a light of itself. And just as when butter or oil burns, it produces neither cinder nor ash, so too in the burning of the Blessed One's body, neither the outer skin nor the inner skin nor the flesh nor the sinews nor the oil or the joints produced any cinder or ash, only the bones remained. And of the 500 twin wrappings, only two were burnt, the innermost and the outermost. When the Blessed One's body was consumed, a cascade of water poured down from the sky and extinguished the pyre and water welled out from underground and extinguished the pyre. And the Malians of Kusanara extinguished the pyre with all kinds of scented waters. Then the Malians kept the Blessed One's bones in the assembly hall for seven days and they made lattice frames of spears set around with a rampart of bows and they honored, respected, revered and venerated them with dances, song, music, garlands and scents. Now this is very interesting. 
King Ajatasattu of Magadha heard, the Blessed One, it seems, has attained final Nibbana. Then he sent an envoy to the Malians of Kusanara with the demand, the Blessed One was a warrior, I too am a warrior. I am worthy of a share of the Blessed One's bones. I too will build a monument and hold a ceremony. So understanding that Magadha is a very powerful kingdom and the king is saying, give us the bones. Then the Lichavis are basically heard likewise. We were there yesterday, isn't that nice to be able to recollect? We were looking at the old stupa in Vesali, in the middle of the town and the water where the royal family bathed and we went out to the site where the Ratana Sutta was taught, etc., in the Bhikkhuni order that was in Vesali. If you recall, we had a nice meditation there in the middle of the day. The Lichavis of Vesali heard likewise and they sent an envoy with the demand. The Blessed One was a warrior, we two are warriors, we two are worthy of the share of the Blessed One's bones, we will build a monument. And then the Sakyans, of which the Buddha was one, heard likewise and they too sent an envoy with the demand. The Blessed One was the greatest of our blood. We too are worthy of a share. And the Bullians of Alakapaka and the Kolians of Ramagama and the Brahman of Veta and the Malians of Pava etc. When this had been said, the Malians assembled the envoys and answered them thus, the Blessed One attained final Nibbana in the precincts of our town. We will not give up the bones of the Blessed One. <laughs> then the Brahman Dona addressed the assembled group with these stanzas, Sir, hear a word from me. Our awakened one preached patience. So it ill becomes us now that we should come to clash over a share in that exalted personage's bones. Sirs, let us all unite in harmony and in agreement to make up eight parts. Let monuments be set up far and wide that many may gain trust in the seer. Then Brahman, you yourself should divide up and distribute the Blessed One's bones fairly into eight equal parts. Even so, sirs. He replied and he divided up and distributed the Blessed One's bones fairly into eight equal parts. Then he asked the assembled group, Give me this vessel, sirs. I too will build a monument and hold a ceremony. And they gave him the vessel. Then the Mauryans of Pipalivana heard the Blessed One, it seems, has attained final Nibbana in Kusanara. They sent an envoy with the demand. The Blessed One was a warrior. We too are warriors. We too are worthy of a share of the Blessed One's bones. We too will build a monument and hold a ceremony. There is no share of the Blessed One's bones left. They have all been distributed. You may take the ashes. So they took the ashes. Then Ajatasattu, Veda Hiputta, king of Magadha, had a monument built to the Blessed One's bones and he held a ceremony and all the others did likewise. So there were eight monuments to the Blessed One's bones and one to the vessel and one to the ashes. That is how it happened. So what is interesting about Prince Ajatasattu, if you recall, we were in Rajgir just the other day, Prince Ajatasattu was the, for a period of time, evil prince who had been swayed by Devadatta to imprison and starve and torture his father to death, which he did do. What happened was when he had a child, looking at the vulnerability of his son and he loved his son and he suddenly remembered, as is appropriate, that the king was his father and the king had loved him as a child and he was overcome with remorse and he actually tried to to go and see his father, but the father had died. But anyway, one of the things I love about the Buddha's teachings and the Buddha's dispensation and the way his teachings are presented, and I'm sure you love it too, is that there's no inherently permanent evil either. So that's the wonderful thing about impermanence, is that even evil is impermanent. So Prince Ajatasattu, at the end of his life, became much more righteous and apparently he carried the Buddha's ashes back to Rajgir on his head. So that merit will eventually ripen of course but because he did kill his father who was a Sotapanna at the moment he's apparently in the lowest hell experiencing a lot of heat and he will be experiencing it till the end of the eon which is a long time. But then after that he gets another chance and then eventually he will also be enlightened. And we were really lucky, aren't we, that today we were meditating twice in the place where Lord Buddha attained Mahaparinibbana, and then we were meditating in the afternoon where the body was cremated. And just like the Kusanarans of old and all of those people of old circumambulating three times on the right, offering flowers, offering fragrances, which Lord Buddha is himself saying produces merit, which is helpful, 
to our final attainment. So I hope that reading was edifying. And we'll go back tomorrow. We go back tomorrow. And I, I think it's really wonderful to have that situation to meditate in where you can feel these... It's like a really good workshop opportunity where you can feel these layers of feelings and really work with trying to find the unconditioned. It's like on one level it's sad. On another level, if you don't allow your mind to fall into the sadness, it's serenely peaceful. And that's what I'm finding. I didn't feel sad today. The first time I came to Kusanara, I wept. I actually read some of the Mahaparinibbana to another group of people. This is 11 years ago. And when I finished, I, I wasn't rolling around with my arms, but I was mopping up tears. It was sad. But then I, when Arjuna Nan has said, the Buddha didn't go anywhere. I was talking earlier that the Buddha wouldn't answer the question about the destination of Arahant's minds after death or whether or not Nirvana is in samsara or outside of samsara. He would only call it things like the unconditioned, the deathless. It's something that you can't define with words. It's beyond concepts. But the fact that it is superior to death, beyond death, the fact that it is not a condition, then and he does say that his teaching is not a nihilistic teaching. So nothing was annihilated except for greed, hatred and delusion. That which is deathless obviously didn't die and that which was not a condition obviously remains unconditioned. And so I think it's a really wonderful and rich opportunity when we go in there and meditate to feel those layers of feeling and then find that awareness that just knows a sad feeling is a sad feeling because it's so spiritually charged my experience is that you can find it if you want to. You can find a space in the mind which knows things as they are, which isn't sorrowing. And at the same time, the sorrow can be there, but you can separate the mind from the mind object and then feel really confident about that when you do it. When you can separate awareness from an object and then you are trust. Awareness is the refuge. Mindful awareness is your refuge. That's the Dhamma. That's how you practice the Eightfold Path, the Samma Sati, the Samma Samadhi. So we've still got a very good situation to contemplate these things. And when you do touch that special clarity, special quiet, special peace, special silence in these places, make a kind of an affirmation. This is what I trust. This is the refuge. This is what I want to cultivate. This is what I want to experience more. Because it's a very powerful place to make those kind of aspirations. We're about halfway through of our pilgrimage. So far, so good. Leslie has a bit of a cold now. Yours is okay? Yeah, it's still a cold. Lingering a little bit. Sanja, how's yours? Yeah. Were you doing the cold prevention treatments before you came, as I'd suggested? Yeah. And that's why I think you recovered quickly. <laughs> I think it helps because you get better more quickly, don't you? Otherwise, these colds in India are in bed for a week. We're very lucky. I met a monk in the foyer this morning at five who was going to Bodh Gaya today to meditate for one hour before his group goes back to Thailand tomorrow. So they had 12 hours in the car. That's if they didn't meet traffic jams. So that they could have one hour at the Bodhi tree before going back. So you don't have this perspective, but I know you're very lucky. <laughs> We've got lots of time. So in the morning, you don't have to go out in the cold. What is it? Six, seven, eight tomorrow? Six, seven, eight. Six, seven, eight. Okay. Wake up at six. Break at seven with a nice full tummy. Go out into the cool but not too cold air. And we're staying until 10.45, so tomorrow you have a lot of time. So we might try to meditate inside and then maybe after an hour go and find a tree. Meditate outside. It is, yeah. It is beautiful. And again, I'll talk about practicing with the different energies, like some of the energies that swarm around that statue that aren't very wholesome. They're not, I don't want to say too much about it, but if you just kind of see what's happening, the, there's some interesting energies there. And you know, you can, as you noticed in Vulture's Peak with the priest guy, that when, when there's that much goodness in the air, the mind doesn't, is less likely to fixate on a negative perception. 
you can just kind of see it in awareness. And you stay, stay with that which is worth staying with. And don't send the mind out to the, to the negative perception. So that's, you know, practicing in holy sites is such a rich opportunity for just seeing that. You see the nature of the mind more clearly and your capacity to be mindful of things. And you get a lot of help. So I think we'll all be taking away lots of good memories and good experiences and some little insights to nourish your practice for a long time. You think so? Very good. <laughs> Some people look sleepy. I tend to be very awake at night, that's my character. <laughs> right. <laughs> Poor old Ajahn Papro, when we were in we were in India in Bokai in February and March and at ten o'clock I was just kind of warming up for a chat. <laughs> he's a morning person. But he's very patient. He even listened to me while I was asleep. <laughs> <laughs> fall asleep and I'm still chatting. He is a wonderful companion. Ajahn Pavaru was a professor of comparative religion. So you can ask him anything about any religion. <laughs> Could be some interesting answers. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know that one. I don't know. I've <laughs> never heard of it. <laughs> Very modest and humble monk.